Yeah, so what we're going to do is we're going to head down to Stockwell. Um, and we are going to start at the bottom and work our way up. I'm going to go to Van Gogh Walk, okay. which is um, a really great scheme that was delivered, not by us, but by the local authority working really closely with the local community. And it really is a transformational change to the street. Nice. Um, what's really interesting about here, though, um, is that uh, it's old World War II bomb damage. It's been for a really long time, Bonington Square has been this really important community space. Yeah. Um, huge amount of community ownership. Um, but together with uh, Lambeth Council over the years, they've kind of worked together, you know, and you can see the kind of, the, the quality of materials and, and the way the park sort of falls into the street. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, lots of public seating, but there is still a, a very strong community sense of ownership. You see a lot of the houses around here have planters out on the street. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a really beautiful part of London, tucked right behind Vauxhall. You know, it was so hectic, so busy, mm -hmm. and you are meters away, and it's just this calm oasis in the middle of the city. Yeah. Um, so this is always a lovely place to start the conversation. You've got people sitting out on the street. Um, yeah, it's just been done really well. Uh, not a lot of through traffic, so you can spend time in the street, but traffic can still come through. But it has a very, mu very much has a feel that people are first here, yeah. and traffic is second. Traffic is kind of a guest. Um, so in these areas, which are high pedestrian footfall and low vehicle um, movement, it just makes for you know obviously a really beautiful, lovely space. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so we'll start here, head south, and then work our way back. I love it, I love it. Uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, introduce yourself? Yeah, sorry, I'm Ben Addy. I'm the head of um, Networks and Collaborative Design, which is going through a name change to something more understandable, which is transport planning and engagement. Um, these are all just labels, but we basically take an equity-led approach to um, equity-led approach to transport planning in the mm -hmm. city. So yeah. we take a people-first approach, an engagement-first approach to working on a whole wide range of changes to our streets and spaces right. in the city. Yeah, and which organization are you with? Yeah, that's a good point. I work <laughs> for Sustrans, uh, which are a national walking and cycling charity, but uh, my team and my work is focused on, on the city of London because of the way that the, the funding and the politics work is London is a little bit of an island, but, yeah. um, but obviously still fully cooperating with the rest of the country. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, earlier you had mentioned, you know, the, the, the cafe and the articulation to the street. And literally, we actually see that. We see the raised, you know, little crossing right here. And uh, I was sitting at a table over by the tree there. And sure enough, you know, motor vehicles do come through here, mm -hmm. but they come through at a very, very slow pace. Yeah. That's the whole point. Well, yeah, exactly. I think um, they're not using it as a cut through. Basically, it doesn't yeah. go anywhere. Yeah. So, you know, they're using it to access the area locally and the delivery of goods and services, um, but it is a people space. So people use it to cut through. Yeah. You, can, you can use the park as a, sometimes a day to cut through and take out the corner. So people, there's lots of foot traffic, passing traffic, it feels safe. Um, there is another cafe which is sometimes open, sometimes not, just down there. Mm -hmm. And it attracts that kind of, um, yeah, it attracts that busyness. It feels vibrant and vital and it's economically thriving. I mean, the cafe mm -hmm. is, you know, what day of the week is Thursday afternoon. Yeah. And the cafe is really, really busy. It is, um, yeah. But yeah. then obviously you can also see that services are being delivered. Yeah. Like the electric van that just drove by. Yeah, so, yeah. As well um, as an electric green Porsche. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> of all things. The changing city. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Well, hey, everybody, thank you for tuning in to the Active Towns channel. Uh, my name is John Zimmerman. You probably know that already. And uh, what, uh, what neighborhood are we actually in? So this is Vauxhall, um, okay. and we are in South London, so mm -hmm. south of the river, uh, still central, uh, and we will be flitting between Vauxhall and Oval. Yeah, very good. In very the good. London Borough of Lambeth. And technically, uh, we refer to these neighborhoods as LTNs, is that correct? Uh, it just depends on them. I mean, the term LTN has yeah. become a little bit toxic. Has uh, it? Okay. Late. All right. Um, How dare they? But, uh, yeah. <laughs> but well, yeah, I mean, they're kind of people first neighborhoods, quiet yeah. neighborhoods, livable neighborhoods, slow traffic neighborhoods. Yeah. A whole range of different terms. Um, but this one's actually been like this for a really long time. Right. So it's, it's not part of the most recent wave of. Um, of Initiatives. Remo yeah, removing but it, traffic. It, if this has been around for a while, it may have inspired. Oh, it definitely yes. has. And there's loads of examples of that where mm -hmm. traffic's been removed, through traffic's been removed from neighborhoods for a whole range of other reasons. All right. sorts, you know, in North London, you've got some examples where it's been, uh, roads were filtered to prevent curb crawling and drug yeah. dealing, for example. Yeah. And then suddenly, actually, they also make for a really great 
neighborhood. And if you were to say to those residents, we're going to take this out now, mm -hmm. there would be uh, people would be up in arms. But yeah. Um, yeah, so and I think what is important with this is often with those sorts of neighborhood schemes where you remove that through traffic mm -hmm. in some time, sometimes that's seen as the end goal, right. just simply the removal of the traffic. But it, it, for, yeah. for me and for our organization in London, that is only ever the first step. Right. Removal of traffic is just yeah, step one. Yeah. Step two is then how do you bring that space to life? How do you make sure that people feel that they can then put their plant pots out on the street, how they can sit out, how businesses can then open up and go open right. up their tables out there. So it's about that activation. How can you use 80% of London's public space is the street. Yeah. Um, and how can we, and lots of people live in flats with very limited outdoor space. So how can we ensure that people have access to the street as a public space? Yeah. And the greatest impediment to that is fast moving, high volumes of through yeah. traffic. Yeah. Um, and if you re reduce that, you then allow opportunities for you know, greening, for play, for socialization. Um, and you know you can see that all here. So. Yeah, yeah. It's almost as if what you know, because we have calmed the automobile in the space and really enhanced the the design for people, mm -hmm. a people-oriented approach, we have a high vitality or high vibrancy neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. Oh, definitely. You have yeah. a real energy to it, and people yeah. are connected. You know, you can guarantee that people will know each other. They will know who their neighbors are. Yeah. You know, and you obviously got that very famous Apple Yard study that shows the busier a street is, the less likely you are to know your neighbor. Yeah. You know, I can guarantee you most people here will know each other. Um, and I think that's what you're trying to get to, and that's what all these other different initiatives that come with a lower trafficked neighborhood uh, bring you. So, you know, we've got an organization here in the UK called Playing Out, who yeah. do so much work about bringing play streets back to our neighborhoods. Correct, yeah. Um, and that's, you know, I, I, I do something very similar in a slightly less formal way, but just dragging a basketball hoop out onto the street and writing slow, kids, mm -hmm. and, kids and adults at play. Yeah. You know, and then all of a sudden you get to speak to your neighbors that you never really see. Kids who are new to the neighborhood can come out and ask to play. Right. And that's just not going to happen if everyone's having to travel to their local park, and it's certainly not going to happen if everyone's playing in their back garden. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It is interesting, too, I was having this discussion not too long ago about how uh, the word traffic has been sort of commandeered to become a negative. Yeah. And so we're talking about a low traffic neighborhood, but what we're really trying to say is it's a, uh, we're, we're trying to reduce the amount of negative impact that cars are having yeah. uh, from a, a business perspective. It's actually a high traffic neighborhood now of yeah. footfall, of yeah. people people coming by. And to your point, when I was over at the, the cafe table over there by the, t uh, by the uh, tree, go ahead and grab, Thanks, grab yeah. a drink, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll finish this thought here. Um, to your point, exactly. People were coming up and, and, uh, and, and seeing friends and coming by and starting up, up a conversation. Yeah. And so it really is that, uh, you know, we, we have the, the people-oriented traffic of people walking by and strolling by and seeing friends, you know, is there. So that it yeah. gets back to that vibrancy and the vitality of the community. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that has economic ramifications and it has socialization, it has, you know, the city can be a lonely place for people as well, and it brings yeah. that kind of. It can help tackle tackle loneliness. I think it's really great as well that you're, you know, in your, in the conversation so far, you've been focused so much on walking because I think mm -hmm. in these schemes, walking kind of gets lost. Yes, it all becomes about the cycling, mm -hmm. and the cycling becomes the controversial thing. Mm. But everybody walks. Yeah, and a street that is good for cycling will also be good for walking. And these neighbourhoods, these lower traffic neighbourhoods, are fantastic yeah. for walking. And I right. think that's something that in London has gotten lost a little bit right. in the conversation because it's been all about cyclists or we're doing all of this work for cyclists mm -hmm. um, as if they are a breed unto themselves. Well, it's um, almost a disservice to uh, what these communities do because when we are, look at the, the bike and we'll pull back and, and get our bikes in focus here, <laughs> and swing around and bikes. see, you know, we've got other people who have arrived by bike, is that it's not about the prototypical cyclist, no. it's about um, pedestrian plus, you know. Yeah. This is a tool that allows us to be able to go just a little bit further because yeah. our, our range or, or a person's range on uh, by foot might be limited, especially yeah. if they have a little bit of an injury or, or, yeah. or disability. Oh, definitely. And so being able to cycle on, you know, on a, on a device, a mobility device, i.e., yeah. a bicycle, uh, you know, it, it can. So 
you know, kind of countering that image of oh, what absolutely. this is all about. It's not about the long distance cyclists and the sports cyclists necessarily. Or the or yes. Yeah, and when we when we come out onto the main road and we cycle down, yeah. you know, we will see some commuter cyclists yeah. coming along. And then we see um, Yeah, and you've got this which oh. opens it all up, which is fantastic. Yeah. And yeah. you know, and I think also it is about it's about those deliveries. Mm -hmm. It's about parents taking their children to school on their bikes. Yeah. It's about people being able to do the the weekly shop by using a cargo bike or using their bicycle. You know, these aren't lycra clad people wanting to, you know, time trialing. Right, yeah. <laughs> these are people just going about their daily lives and using, as you say, a tool to make that a little bit easier. Yeah. And a yeah. bit more joyful too. Yeah. Well, speaking of Pedestrian Plus, I think we've got to move along. We've yeah. got some things to see. That's right. All right, cool. You've got your map, so let's do it. Cool. All Thanks, right. man. <laughs> so obviously we've got the river up there. And then this is heading out towards, this is kind of heading out of it's taking people out of London. So you would see at like five o'clock, you would see a huge flow of people coming this way and a huge flow in the morning of people coming that way. Right, yeah. Yeah, okay, great. So we're just gonna head down here and then the road does this little funny thing on, you'll see when we get down there, it just does a funny thing, we'll have to cross the road. But, okay. Um, yeah. Oh, I might just swig this and chuck it in the bin actually, because it's, All right. it's a little tricky. Yeah, I know. Flow. Especially when we get in the traffic here. Yeah. see a little bit of the traffic control and see no entry here. I actually think that's quite an interesting reflection because mm -hmm. riding along drinking your coffee is far more doable in a sort of low traffic neighborhood. <laughs> whereas you need your wits about you a little bit more so along here. So it's yeah, yeah, no, that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there's something called the coffee test or something. I see that uh, frequently in the in the Netherlands when I'm there. It's like, uh, especially on a, on a Friday evening, the guys will be riding along with their uh, their beer in their hand. <laughs> yeah, that's the test. Especially in the college towns. Yeah, that's great. The ultimate test. So this is very early cycle superhighway we're going along here. Yeah. Where. The initial ones were basically just blue paint on the floor. But they set the tone for where we are now, really, with the improved infrastructure, the separated infrastructure. And obviously, without these, I don't think we'd be where we are. Yeah. But the difference is quite marked yeah. <laughs> between then and now. So we're just going to head down here, and then we'll work our way back because it's quite an interesting story, the sort of development of design that happens even on a single project. Right. And I think, uh, I think that's what's so fascinating about, you know, the delivery of this kind of work in the city is the extent to which it changes so quickly, even within one project. Right. It's changing. Yeah. The ambition, what's possible, the approach. So yeah. Keep you on your toes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now we're talking. Look at this narrow street here. So it'd be, you know, you've obviously got a mix of housing. It's a pretty old neighborhood. Okay, so bring us uh, up to speed. What uh, is the relevance of the neighborhood we're in now? So we're heading towards Van Gogh Walk, which is a sort of historical, well, not historical, but it's a, you know, it's been, I actually can't remember when it was done, but you know, over 10 years ago, scheme that was designed to tackle through traffic. Again, we're gonna go left here. Again, was very kind of community centered. So it was very much focused on the community really pushing for change. It's in a location which is mixed. So you've got some very expensive houses, you've got some social housing, and you've got obviously a school. Um, we're gonna go left here. So, yeah, and it's in an area where Van Gogh apparently lived. So this oh, is wow. why it's called Van Gogh Walk. You've okay. got the little sign up here, which I think is yeah. something that we wanna see much more of. Yeah. So now we're entering it. We're actually gonna go left here. So again, the street here is open to, is open to the traffic, but it's 
you know, it's a very different space. It almost, you know, very much feels like cars are guests here. Yeah. So you've got a hoop in the street, which is my absolute favorite feature. Yeah, yeah, I'll swing around and get a of shot of any street in London. Yeah. And uh, you've got play features. And your, your boy likes to play basketball. Yeah, he yeah. likes to play basketball. So when I've yeah. shown, he hasn't been here, but when I've shown yeah. him pictures of the basketball hoop, he is very jealous and wants the same installed in our street. Fantastic. And how old is he? Um, he's 14. OK, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, so you've got in here, you've got, you know, as you've just seen, cars can come through. Sure. But they do so very slowly. This yeah. section over here is completely car free. But um, on this bit, you've got planting, you've got playable features, you've got cycle parking, seating. Um, the idea is when the school spills out, some kids continue to play in here. Um, and again, just like Bonington Square, it's a respite from the city. We've just yeah. come off that really busy road. And again, the neighborhood is a place that should be, that should be calm, that should be welcoming, that should be for, for all. Right. So, you know, the, the sign of a successful street is where you have children playing and older people sitting talking. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you have that in this space. Um, and I can show you an example as we go this way of, of how not to do it. Okay. But yeah, this is, this is, this is great. And, you know, you don't see many things like this in the city. And yeah. I, get, I think the question that we kind of ask ourselves is, you know, why can't we do more of this? Right. Obviously, it's not a cheap undertaking. You know, this kind of surfacing and the removal of surfaces and the changing lighting and, you know, it's an expensive project, an undertaking. Well, I would interject and say that it, this is pennies on the dollar compared to automobile infrastructure. Oh, yeah. So when we actually compare it to a good comparison, yeah. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Is, yeah. And if you're, you know, if you're trying to, you know, yeah. make changes to the A3 we were just in, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but in terms of neighborhood schemes, right. it's 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 on the pricier end. But you know, I think got... the return on investment is oh, there, though. I absolutely. Mean, it's you, you invest in creating something that's truly special. You yeah. mentioned the fact that there's a school right here. The kids kind of, kind of play out. So this actually sort of uh, operates a little bit like one of the school street kinds of concepts. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. And you just, you want to allow, yeah, you want to allow people to operate in the street. As we said, this is an important public space. So beyond school, beyond work, beyond being inside the house, you know, it's another place for people to come together. And I think the ambition of this scheme, it's telling that it came from the community, that community right. buy-in. And recently, you know, there's, I just was talking about this on LinkedIn, but you know, there's this requirement from local authorities to, um, for, you know, if you're going for a proposal, if you're putting a proposal together for a, for a brief, mm -hmm. um, for a scheme, you know, such as we would do at Sustrans, one of the requirements is to demonstrate social value. Right. And often that, that's, that, it's not clear what people mean really by that. And there's a real right. risk of it becoming a, a tick box exercise. Right. This is social value. Right. You know, this ability to be able to bring a community together to deliver a change, which then means that they probably feel more empowered in other areas of their life more engaged in maybe the political process or more likely to have their say in other consultations that come forward. Yeah. You know, that's true social value yeah. and delivering that kind of long-term ambitious change for an area. I would also say too, you know, we talked about it when we were at the cafe, the social value of the social cohesiveness that takes yeah. place. So when you do create a space like this where people can come, they gather, uh, you mentioned earlier, you know, someone will feel comfortable at grabbing a seat over there. Uh, you, you're able to prime the pump, so to speak, for yeah. the, those social interactions to take place. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. I think also, you know, so many times the reasons why these sort of schemes don't go ahead is concerns over antisocial behavior, so concerns about, you know, antisocial behavior around seating, seat drinking, uh, concerns about people playing out, concerns around maintenance of green space. But when you have that community buy-in and you have well-designed schemes that have engagement at their heart, and that where you know the allocation of funding for long-term maintenance is there as well. Right. You can deliver spaces like this, and, and as opposed to assuming the worst, deliver the best and see what happens and make changes from there if necessary. I'm glad you brought up uh, long-term maintenance and things of that nature. So for an installation such as this, who's, who's really responsible for the upkeep, the maintenance uh, of uh, a scheme like this? So there'll be the local authority. Mm -hmm. um, well, depending on where it is, the TfL, Transport for London, have responsibility for, their, for the, some of the main roads in London. So they will have responsibility for those spaces. Anything else is the responsibility of the local authority. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so it's their responsibility, for example, when you have someone come in to, so Thames Water come in to repair a water main, the borough needs to make sure that the, the, the Thames Water, for example, right here, if they were to dig this up, would have a responsibility to lay it back as it was. Okay. And unfortunately, so often, that isn't always the case, depending on the service provider. So the local authority needs to be on top of that to make sure, because you know this scheme would look vastly different if you had a great swathe of asphalt coming through here. Right, right. Um, but again, it's that community buy-in, like them having a role within that right. um, is so important because the local authority only has so much resource, time and funding. Yeah. And that needs to be this constant dialogue between local people and the council. Yeah. But again, you can see the speed at which people are passing through here. This is a, you know, and occasionally when I have been here, you get one or two cars that do come through very quickly. Sure, sure. But they're the anomaly. Yeah. Um, and they will know that they are doing the wrong thing by yeah. coming through here. Yeah. Um, and down here, you can see, you know, what, what this then leads to. So this would have been delivered. Then things in London, like the cycle um, hangers, for example, mm -hmm. for cycle right. parking on the street. Yes. They came along after this was delivered. So then it, it's this constant evolution of what it means to occupy the street. Right. So even on that street, which looks like a relatively normal London street, albeit with street trees in the carriageway, which right. is you know, really important, you've now added cycle, cycle parking. Um, and over time, you, you'll probably see, uh, I don't know, electric on-street on electric vehicle charging will come in. And that the nature of the street, rather than a place to park your private vehicle, it's a place, it's, it's far more sort of around community asset rather than private asset. Right, right. Um, and so that complements this kind of project beautifully. Brilliant. Yeah. Lovely. All right. Cool. We're so roll we down can, this way. Yeah, pop through here and you can see more. Um, I think some of the planting originally was devised with some of Van Gogh's paintings in mind. Oh, okay. Um, and then, you know, so, but, you know, this space, you could imagine people saying, well, this is going to be an anti-social space. Right. But, and you might, and, and it's not to say that you won't ever get that. Right. But, you know, you've got these playable features, you've got a library, you've got, and this is purely for walking and cycling, obviously. Right, right. And some of those worst case, case scenarios just don't transpire. Right. But what's interesting is you then progress into what is a private space. Right. And you compare Van Gogh Walk, which is a mix of social housing and, and private housing, and then you come into this private estate, of which the local authority have no jurisdiction, um, and you've obviously got barriers, you've got pretty uninspiring planting, and you have what, you know, could be described as the Maginot Line right here. Oh, yeah. Um, which is about as inaccessible as you can possibly get. Yeah. And this is the alternative. If you are, if you are, you know, and to my mind, it's, it's, it's sterile. It's not a place that you'd want to spend time in. And the alternative to taking risks and putting faith in community and prioritizing people in the street, all people, is you get this which is this sort of dystopian, sterile, inaccessible, inequitable, non-public space. Right. Which, to my mind, has absolutely no place in, in our city. Right. The only good thing I would say about this neighborhood are these bins. These are the sort of French style um, where, so you see a lot of residential streets in London because of the lack of space are filled with wheelie bins. Right. Whereas on this private piece of land, they've obviously got these kind of more communal bin setups where you right. dump your trash and then, and the same as in France and Spain, and it's in a yeah. larger, <laughs> which is yeah. a much yeah. better use of space. Yeah. Um, so, you know, to give it its one due is the, yeah. the trash. You got the trash right. Yeah, you got the trash right. <laughs> Everything else is way off, but yeah. I'd love it. <laughs> so this is part of their low traffic neighborhood that Lambeth delivered. Okay. So we're straight off the, the main road here. You've got uh, Santander or City bike hire there, um, and the and the and the filter obviously, and then you come into here, which is obviously a mix of housing, and so this is one of the so Lambeth commissioned us to do a bit of engagement and do um, some design work for how we could um, bring some of these filters like this a bit more to life. Right. And what you um, what we found is during the during the pandemic. Uh, there was lots of lots of LTNs and other you know cycle lanes developed with sort mm -hmm. of temporary semi-permanent features. Yeah. 
planters in the street, that sort of thing. Um, and what we found is that over time, those started to, you know, inevitably over two or three years, started to look a bit tired. Right. Start, you know, planters, plants died or uh, people started using them as giant trash cans or, you know, it just looks tired. Yeah. And again, it's that thing that I was talking about, about the, the first step being removing the traffic. Yeah. The next step is what you do with it. So this is one of the first schemes that we worked up um, in collaboration with Lambeth. Um, the ambition is, is pretty light, really. What you've got here is just, you know, some really nice planting, some tree planting, narrowing the entranceway, making it really clear that this is, you know, lots of pedestrian space, making it very clear where the cycle infrastructure is through here and where the pedestrian space is. Obviously opens up into a little park. Um, and it's just a small piece of um, street infrastructure that, you know, builds on the planters that were here previously, basically. Yeah. So it's not, you know, it's, there's nothing about this that's reinventing the wheel, but it is just, it definitely softens the landscape. Right. And it tells you as you're coming off this busy road and you've got this avenue of planes, plane trees, it then, you know, you then enter through this sort of gateway into a residential area. And I think that kind of, you almost breathe a sigh of relief when you come and walk through these spaces, right. you know? You're just right. suddenly like, ah, oh, I'm on my way home. It's, yeah. you know, um, so yeah, it's nice. And this little avenue is so lovely. And obviously it's really important given the, the mix of housing and making sure that these spaces, you know, are legitimately for everybody. Yeah. So. And uh, explain again that relationship. You were contracted by the, the community, is that correct? No, by, uh, the, by the council. The council, yeah. okay. So yes. we were commissioned yes. by the council to yes. um, carry out a small bit of engagement mm -hmm. uh, and then all the design work and for the, design for the delivery. Work, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so at Sustrans we've got transport planning teams, engagement team, um, behavior change team that do a lot of activation of streets mm -hmm. and spaces. And then we have our design and engineering team which have yeah. landscape architects, urban designers, highway engineers. Um, and in that role we support local authorities and historically Transport for London yeah, with the delivery of a whole range of different schemes. Yeah. In the same way that other consultancies do. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. So what's yeah. nice about this is this is the first one we did. And as we progress, you'll see that, uh, you'll, see the trend, you'll see the change over the coming months as, as schemes became more ambitious, as there was greater buy-in for this kind of approach, maybe mm -hmm. deeper engagement as we went on. Um, and you know that's really that's all over the same scheme essentially. Right, right. But you know just that you deliver this and then you go on to the next thing and you think, well, what more can we do? And local councillors, local politicians get a little bit more confident. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of controversy around some of these schemes, and so yeah. when they see this one being delivered successfully like this, they're then like, okay, yeah, well, let's open the door to seating or to other things. And it's notable right. that you know there is no seating here, for example. Yeah. And as we'll see, that changes as we as we move on. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, and, and to your point too, you know, you, you start off with your lighter, quicker, cheaper materials that you do in an emergency type of situation, like with COVID. Yeah. But then you quickly, once you've kind of, you know, reserved the real estate, so to speak, uh, you try to get into something that's of a higher quality and something that's beauti beautiful. Yeah. So that you don't have that as being one of the excuses where community members are saying, I don't like this, it's ugly. Well, yeah, yeah, and I think that's a legitimate point too. You know, yeah. I think you know, that broken window syndrome is, is a thing. Yeah. Um, and I think it's also just about, you don't need to use, you know, black granite and hand carved right. curbs, you yes. know. <laughs> These are all materials that will be in Lambert's yard or within yeah. their supplier's yard. So the curb breaks, it can be replaced the next day. The planting dies, it can be replaced. You yeah. know, there's nothing here that isn't easily maintained. And you can see the planting has been maintained well and Lambeth have got a good maintenance program. Right. Um, you know, from the design perspective, there's a lot of signage and you'll see this in the other schemes, uh, which is, you know, you'd want, you'd want over time as people get used to the scheme for that to be reduced. Yeah. Because it just still feels, you know, it's quite highway feeling with lots of line marking, yellow, yellow line. Do you need yellow lines through here? Do you need such big signage over time? Hopefully yeah. not. Right. Um, because right. it softens the space. And again, so this, all this signage is all designed for motor vehicles. Right, right. You know, yeah. It's not people. It's not for people. So we need, yeah. to, move, we need to try and move, move beyond that. But yeah. for, the, for, the, for, the, for the now, 
yeah. know, it's not a bad it's not a bad scheme, and, and definitely as we see it progress, it gets better and better. Yeah, well, let's go uh, um, look at some of the newer stuff. Yeah, great. All right. You know, it's just lovely seeing all these things come together, you know, like the cycle parking, EV parking, even the, you know, the London Santander parking, formerly known as Boris Bikes. Oh, right, yeah. Um, it's funny how, I guess, with like so much in life, one thing lends, then moves to another. Right. You know, you deliver this cycle lane, then the LTN comes, then cycle hire comes, then cycle shelters come, and... Yep, it all adds up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so this is the next one. So again, this isn't a straight filter, this is a one-way. Um, but as you then enter the, into the low traffic neighborhood, the idea is, at the time, this was um, a restaurant, and we anticipate it hopefully will become a restaurant again. But that's, you know, hence the seating for people to spill out. But, you know, when we've been here previously, people do still come and sit out. There's obviously a development site in between these two buildings. So it'll be interesting because what, what's great is, you know, when you deliver this infrastructure, you start to change the form and function of the street and the buildings around it, and especially the buildings Given this is a city that's constantly reinventing itself and constantly changing, I think taking for the city to take its kind of for architects, you know, who um, I know lots of architects, so this is fine for me to say. I don't always listen to what other people think. Right. Um, <laughs> right. So when when they come here and think about their building, they will suddenly be thinking about it in the context of what's happening in the street. Right. And that will hopefully change the relationship of the building to the street. Um, so here you can see there's a lot of planting, there's trees. Again, it's a nice space as you're coming off. It again is that gateway into a residential area off a busier road. Um, the transition towards thinking about sustainable urban drainage. So you've, you know, there's a runoff scheme here. So the water runoff comes into the, into the, into the bed. Um, it's improved, enhanced the pedestrian environment. And again, it's that going back to the earlier point about not forgetting that these schemes are as much about pedestrians as anybody else. People, everybody walks. And, and you know, these schemes are really adding to that. Um, and I think what, what this does is it adds, it adds utility, it adds wider pavements, it adds the seating, but it adds greening, but not in a kind of political promise to plant 5,000 new trees in the city, wherever they may go, wherever they may or may not be appropriate. This is a strategic placement of greening where it's gonna have the most and best effect. Right. Uh, it's not just greening for the sake of greening because it's cheaper than doing something else around climate amelioration. Yeah. So it's a tool to an, a means to an end, and you know, it, it really works. I'm gonna swing the camera around too, just to, to point out that, yeah, we've got our little notches right here. So we do have the ability for storm water to be able to get into there, feeding that rain garden, again, helping sponge soak up some of that uh, excess water. Yeah. That was falling earlier today. <laughs> yeah, now yes. fortunately the sun is out. <laughs> but again, you know, yeah. before, with the temporary scheme, this was, it was just about removal of traffic, and right. now it's about place. Right. Um, which is what's so important. But the, but the trialing is an, an integral, an important phase. Yes, good because, point. Because, you know, you get the chance to try things, and as opposed to spending, a, you know, with all the best will in the world, best transport planner, best engineer in the world, it's not always possible to know what will happen when you do some, make a change to the street. Right. So this idea of trialing and testing is so integral, I think, to delivering change in our towns and cities. Um, and it also really helps to build confidence in local people. Yeah. People, are, as we were saying, are reticent around change sometimes. And, you know, people are experts in their local areas. They're not necessarily experts in transport planning. So when you can come to people and say, you know, learn from them, you know, that's really important. That community-centered design element of our work is essential, where we're able to understand the neighborhood from the people who live here. You know, they're the experts. But we're then able to reassure them and say, right, well, we think this, you know, given all of our conversations and all the work we've done, we think this scheme is the one that will bring the most benefit. Right. And it's always about compromise in the city, you know, crowded, congested place. It's all about compromise. But we think this is the best compromise. We think this is the thing that will work. But we're, you know, but we're going to give it a go. We're going to deliver it for six months. We're going to monitor it. We're going to continue our conversations with you. You can feed back to us because you're here all the time. And if it doesn't work, we'll change it. Right. Yeah. And then when you get to that final point, you do the formal consultation and everyone has their say and the scheme goes permanent, that's when you can then start to really, you know, 
open the door and again open those conversations with local people about well what do you want here what yeah. what will work here yeah you know do people sit here or do people sit over that other side or where does your kid want to play you know where did the kids congregate where is what what's their journey to school maybe we can make that a bit more fun right right um so it's an ongoing conversation yeah there's no real end point i don't think It's really setting the tone. You're coming yeah. off this busy road, which again, you know, has the Cycle Super Highway on it, which, you know, will hopefully in time be upgraded. It's already 20 miles an hour, except for that speeding police car. Uh, and then this is the low traffic neighborhood. So once again, you're coming into this space and it's really clear that this is, this is a cycle space, a pedestrian space. You've got the greening and it's really kind of, um, what's the word, framing the neighborhood in, in, you know and these aren't expensive undertakings these are relatively affordable measures that you can you can do to to, to really change the feel of a space and again you've got the uh, the suds the, the notches in the in the curb to help with drainage and a nice planting scheme but we can continue down here and what's noticeable for me actually you can see here this is a lot less highway right you know the big signs that's kind of hidden by that tree. You've got the wooden posts. You don't have yeah. metal posts. You don't, you've got a little line marking, but not as much in other places. Yeah. And it's softer and it's more people-centered rather than car-centered. Yeah. Um, and I think, that makes, I think that makes a significant difference. And I think that that's part of the result of the iteration is you're able to start fine-tuning the details. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, it's this way. Okay. <laughs> these little alleyways. But you know, you can see the design of new buildings. Yeah. And that matches that sort of scheme. Yeah. And so you'd have to imagine, you know, there's potential development opportunity here at some stage, which will hopefully be framed by, by what we have down here. So, yeah, here's another iteration. Uh, you can see it really takes it to the next level. Um, it's a much larger space that's been, um, reclaimed from the car basically mm -hmm. um, so you, again you've got the nice planting you've got the softer materials you've got the really nice use of materials so you have the brick gateway you've got the trees but then you've got the addition of more informal seating you've got the raised planters for you know which then opens the door to people actually engaging with this space so the planters then feel accessible to local people to, to maintain if they want to right um, you've got the informal seating that sits in the sun. It feels separated from the really busy traffic. Um, and you can see that iteration. I mean, again, lots of signage, but hopefully over time that, 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 that goes. Um, but yeah, it's a really nice scheme. And I think, you know, our designers are really pleased with this. And I think it's, um, yeah, an example of what's possible. It also seems as if uh, some of the materials and some of the designs are almost modular in nature. Yeah. Yeah, I think the idea is that, again, it's, it's, it's the opportunity to fine-tune things. Mm -hmm. So I think the, you know, the idea is those could be moved if you needed to. If, mm -hmm. if it was found over time that a refuse vehicle that may come through here sometimes clips them. So you could, you know, if it did, you could then move it. Right. Um, and maybe over time it also helps with that feeling of because it would have been quite easy to deliver this scheme without this, without the raised beds and the and the seating. Right. But it would have really taken away from the scheme. You really, you know, because at the moment you're really pinching the road down. You can see just mm -hmm. with the marks on the floor where the, the vehicle traffic is. Yeah. And there's probably there's probably arguably room for more, for it to be even tighter. Sure. But um. And that will only be. You know, refuge vehicles, council vehicles, emergency vehicles using this space. Yeah. You know, for these people looking out over here, it's a lovely, it's a lovely piece of public realm. Um, and typically, again, you know, you, on, in some schemes, in some areas, you might get concerned about antisocial behaviour. So, the idea of delivering the cubes is that is it a seat or is it a, is it a bollard? You know, it's kind of that. Sure. It sits on that line and people can use it and interpret the space as, as they want. Yeah. But I like it. Yeah, the yeah. landscaping soft. It feels, again, a lovely gateway into a lovely tree-lined street. So, 
Thank you very much for having everything in bloom. Yeah, try. Yeah, we try. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And so Excellent. we can then yeah. just lead on to the on to the last one of this yeah. set of designs, which kind okay. of encapsulates all of what we've seen before, really. So, right. right. Yeah. Very good. This is certainly what our designers had in mind: is the idea you can't. There isn't the money to transform every square inch of every street. Right. So choose the places where people come together, where people pass through, where there's a a, a trip generator or a shop. Um, and so that was the thinking with here. The thought of our designer was like, this feels like a town square, but it's not because it's bisected by route running traffic. It's right. bisected by, you know, just a simple road junction. But the idea was to bring, and again, the line marking is over the top, really. Yeah. But, you know, hopefully over time that can, that can go. But, you know, you've, you've got the reference of the building lines and then how this space then brings it together. And so traffic, you know, this is only cycle only and you've got traffic coming one way through here and then one way through here. And it, and it creates this town square effect and you're supporting the local businesses who will inevitably often have concerns about the loss of passing trade, for example. Mm -hmm. But you're providing curb build outs that so they can then have seating out there, which is then improving their business. Um, and, you know, you've got to work with them really carefully to understand when do they get deliveries? How can that delivery be facilitated by the design? Mm -hmm. How can we get a loading bay in to ensure that, you know, you can still get your deliveries? Um, and so a lot of what we've seen previously is kind of embodied here. The planting, the strategic placement of trees, the use of different materials to signify different spaces, um, the gateway effect. But this kind of goes beyond that to create this kind of town square effect which mm -hmm. i think is what um is really lovely especially when you have you know incredible buildings like that facing onto the street right uh, it also seems to me too i mean we we take a look at some of these residences here and they have their little uh little patio areas here uh now that it's a much calmer environment i could just imagine you know that life coming out oh yeah Definitely, yeah. and I think it's all about that. We saw that on that earlier scheme about bringing the park out into the street. Mm -hmm. You see that a lot more in, in the city now. Um, this idea of fencing off green space and then having your street, but, but softening those, those boundaries is yeah. really important. And I think yeah. the same is true of housing, and so that people can spill out and easily you know, have a beer with a friend in the street or have a cup of tea with somebody out here. You know, I think it is really important. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, clearly, people that still struggle to read the road signs. Like yes. That guy. The highway maintenance yeah. guy. <laughs> but, um, yeah, you know, you can see there's an awful lot of signage. And again, yeah. I would hope over time, as the culture changes, as people get used to it, you can re you can reduce that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and to our point from earlier, too, is that when we do have, uh, you know, somebody outside lingering a little bit, again, we're enhancing that sociability of the, the realm, the public yeah. realm. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. You know, you're connecting local residents and even just the act of engaging and designing in a space like this mm -hmm. brings people together. Right. You know, we've had previous Sustrans projects where we were working in North London near Turnpike Lane and uh, we held just a pop up on the green space in this residential area and all the surrounding houses came out and very few people knew each other at that point in the project. Right, right. And it turns out the five or six of them had all been burgled within the last month. So yeah. no one knew anybody else had been burgled. Right, right. Um, and so, you know, through the course of that project, a whole residence association was formed. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what, that, again, going back to the social value, that's what these kind of legacy, right. that's what these projects can bring. When yeah. you change the street, you can bring people together. And unfortunately, what often happens is it's, well, what can sometimes happen is it becomes much more divide, divide, divisive. Right. Um, and as opposed to bringing together people together, it pulls them apart. And I would say that nine times out of 10, that is because of the approach that you're taking and you're yeah. not centering engagement in that conversation. And that is what is so fundamentally important and, and not going in with solutions, right. but actually going in and asking people what the problem is, what's the issue that we're trying to solve here. Right. And interesting, actually thinking about this street and the time that I've been in Sustrand, which is like 14 years, you know, I'd often catch the train and the train going into Vauxhall goes from the end of the street here up on an embankment. And you'd look down and you'd see these streets that are tree lined, there's some nice green build outs where there's effectively right here is a tree in the middle of the street. Mm -hmm. And you'd look down and you'd think, wow, that looks like a really interesting street. Right. And again, it's that back to that conversation about one thing leading to another. So hopefully now when people, you know, come through here, they think, wow, what an interesting 
interesting stream. This is really amazing. Right. Um, and, 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 and that kind of appetite just grows. And then all of a sudden, if you live two streets over, you're suddenly contacting your local authority and saying, well, why don't we have that? Yeah. And I hope there's, you know, parents of kids in nearby tower blocks where, you know, near Van Gogh Walk who are like, well, why do they have that basketball court in the street? Where's right. our basketball court? Right, right, yeah. Um, and I think that's a good point too, is once communities come together and they're starting to communicate with each other, and then, yeah, being able to say, yeah, we want that too. Yeah. We want a little bit of this. And I think it's, it's good to, to bring up the divisiveness that inevitably comes up um, because, let's face it, the haters are going to hate. Mm -hmm. But I think it's really important for communities to be patient with the change because, again, change is difficult and to not overreact to those overreactions that take yeah. place. I mean, I think what we often work to, and what I've talked about a lot, is this idea of the sort of spectrum of engagement. Yeah. You only ever have a finite resource, a finite amount of time. And you've got people at either end of the spectrum, people who will love change, the change, yeah. and people who hate the change. Yeah. And they're actually quite small in number, by this point. Exactly. They are really noisy, both yes. of them are. Right. And they can be really unhelpful. They each can. Even the people that really want the change can right. sometimes be kind of unhelpful. Absolutely. So what I, you know, and those people will continue to do their thing. And, yeah. you know, the people who loved the change can be really helpful and, you know, in certain areas. But where the focus needs to be is on the sort of what will often be 90% of the people in the middle. Right. And in a project, you could, your whole time could be taken up with the two ends. Right. And everybody in the middle who is... Uh, who has been disempowered, who has been excluded, who is just busy with family life, other priorities, trying to make ends meet, yeah. they will just get neglected. Yeah. So the effort, the energy that we at Sustrans, where we place our full attention is on that middle ground, is on yeah. the people that are undecided, too busy, yeah. disenfranchised, don't have a voice, yeah. um, and making sure that they are part of the process. Yeah. Because by doing that, you're able to deliver an equitable city. Yeah. Um, and it's about making, you know, I, I think there's this, I've, I've spoken to um, City of Oakland a number of times, Warren yeah. Logan yes. uh, there, who's brilliant. Um, you know, they talk a lot about their equity framework for the right. city, where you deliver change in the city based on a whole set of indicators. Yeah. Rent burden, disability, all these different categories to where you focus your funding. Because the worst thing, the thing that really gets my um, back up is when you have local politicians going out on Twitter, for example, right. and doing a shout out. Who wants a cycle hanger? Yeah. Who wants 20 mile an hour? Who wants, I mean, because straight away, you are excluding a huge raft of people. Right. And if only the loudest people are the ones that really, you know, get the change in their city, you're going to be delivering in the more affluent parts of the city. Right. Typically. The yeah. people who are, have time, have resource, are retired, um, have the connections and you have to take a more equitable approach to the delivery of change. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so, you know, that's one of the, that's what historically been one of our manifesto asks to the mayor. Um, and we see that change happening, which is really exciting. And, yeah. and TfL have a real focus on ensuring that funding goes to the bits of London need it the most. And I think, if anything, our role at Sustrans is to ensure that that happens. Yeah. To advocate for that and to deliver in those spaces. Yeah, yeah. So, this is a message to all of you who are our enthusiastic supporters for change. We love you. Dial it back just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, obviously, those, you know, the campaigners have done so, you know, yeah. I'm one, you know, yes. I want to yeah. see the change. I advocate strongly for it. I campaign in my own neighborhood. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's obviously essential to delivering change. And in London, we're fortunate to have some wonderful um, advocates for that. But in terms of the sort of neighborhood scale delivery, where it's very personal, it's, you know, your, yeah. your, your people are basically welcoming you into their homes. Right. You know, you need to keep it focused and local and you need to give people yeah. the time they need to, I mean, because not everybody walks around the street thinking about curbs, thinking right. about cars, thinking about movement, you yeah. know, no one does. Yeah. The, the um, vast, so, yeah. it's a good reminder that the vast majority of the people out there aren't thinking about this all the time no. and they can be swayed to either of yeah, those two poles. And it takes time yeah. to, to wrap your head around it and yeah. you know it takes time to understand well what does it mean for me yeah. and if my finite amount of time that I can give you in between taking care of my kids, going to work, doing all the other things, you know why is this worth my time? And yeah. You've got to make the case to them, you know you've got to be willing to meet them halfway, you can't expect people 
to come to you. You can't set up an engagement session in a church hall in the middle of the neighborhood at six o'clock on a Wednesday and expect anyone to show up except for the people at the two ends. Right. Yeah. So you've got to go to where people are and yeah. have those conversations. That's a good point too. And, and it also you know, occurs to me too that there might be some value of bringing some of the, the communities that are considering something like this uh, on a little field trip so that they can actually see yeah. what this looks and feels like. Because it's one thing to you know, have it on drawings and diagrams and you know, doing a, a temporary pop-up, which helps with the traffic calming aspect of it. Yeah. It's it's totally another to, to like be able to see. Oh, this is what you meant. Yeah, and speak to you know. We do that a lot. We take people around, and we don't try and sugarcoat it. You yeah, know, we're not trying to hide people from people that have had issues with it. You know, yeah. because those are all part of that conversation. It's all part of that compromise. That right. Finding that point of compromise. Yeah. Um, and I think it's also just about letting people get involved. So we often do street trials where we even get straw bales delivered. Yeah. And we reshape, you know, we'd use them to shape, for example, this shape of it. And then yeah. they come out and people don't know what's going on. They think the city farms come to their neighborhood. And, but then when they realize what's happening, yeah. they then get involved and think, well, that's too narrow. You need to move, you need to move the bale this way a little bit. And yeah. you know, that will work better. And, um, and we do a lot with young people because I think young people are, are a demographic that often get excluded, but they right. are systematically um, denied the ability to function properly in the street, either right. because they're being considered, they're, people are accusing them of acting antisocially, or they just don't have a say. And, and right. the, 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 the function of the street for a child is so different to that as an adult. And you design a street that works for children, you, you do design it for everybody. And I think we do a lot of work where we try and do that transfer of power between adults and young people. So we use Minecraft in that way, for example. Yeah. So we run Minecraft workshops where the young people are teaching the engineers how to use Minecraft right. and designing the street together using that tool. Yeah. And I think when you can level the playing field like that and the engineers realize these teenagers aren't scary and the teenagers realize these engineers aren't entirely boring, um, you know, you, there's a lot of opportunity for collaboration and cooperation there. Yeah. And making very small changes to the public realm on the advice of children can make a huge difference to everybody. They just, yeah. it, you know, it makes the street more joyful. Yeah. Yeah. Ben, this has been so much fun. Uh, yeah. Really, really helpful. And, and congratulations. I mean, this work is is really quite impressive and I can tell that you know many of these communities are going to be you know enjoying this it is going to become a beloved activity asset as well as a community asset to the area so uh, congratulations on all the all that success oh thanks well it's also yeah. a credit to Lambeth Council for wanting to to press ahead with with doing things a bit differently and bringing yeah. the street to life and bringing people into the conversation so yeah. we're just pleased that we could have helped them with that and we hope to see much more of this. Fantastic. How can people learn more uh, about uh, your organization and the work that you all do? Yeah, so we've got, you know, you can just go on our SUSTRANS website, which mm -hmm. is S-U-S-T-R-A-N-S um, dot org dot mm -hmm. UK. Yep. Um, and, you know, there's there's lots of other, you know, we've got lots of case studies. We've, we, we also have the National Cycle Network, which is a huge mm -hmm. network of um, walking and cycling routes all across the UK. So, you know, if anyone's visiting the UK, it's always fun to get out on that. Um, but yeah, we're always interested in and catching up with people, speaking to people. So if anybody ever wants to reach out, we're here. Um, and just let us know when you're in town. Very good. Ben, thank you so much. Cool. Thanks. All right. Yay. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.